Let us pray. Lord, as we journey on with you toward the cross, we become more aware of the things that separate us. Take them from us this day, and as we continue walking, that we might be more faithful disciples. In Christ's name we pray it. Amen. We've come to the fourth Sunday in Lent, the fourth in this sermon series about what we're giving up and giving over that we might better know God. And if you're following along in Mark's gospel, we've come to Mark chapter 13. These verses are part of Jesus' last teachings to his disciples before the final days of his earthly life, sometimes called the farewell discourse, a fancy term for last words. To review, last Sunday, we saw Jesus cleanse the temple of people who were using it to make a profit and oppress others. He was angry about the way we make our faith and our relationships into transactions for our own benefit. And in the scenes between that lesson and the one I'm about to read, Jesus has been teaching in earnest. The time of his own death is coming, and the urgency of his good news is growing. He has given lessons about the meaning of his resurrection, about the commandment to love God and neighbor, about not falling for the seductive words of false prophets, and about the coming destruction of the temple. For new life to come, the old will be destroyed. Our text today comes after all of that, so as you'll hear, it begins with the words, in those days, after that suffering. Jesus names outright that the new life to come will follow hardship. New life will require that the things people know, the things that keep them comfortable, the things that keep us comfortable, are going to die. These verses are sometimes called the little apocalypse, because here Jesus uses cosmic imagery, darkness, the sun, moon, and stars, and a shaking of the powers of the world. These images and these verses echo the Old Testament prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Joel, and Amos, not exactly cheerful books, those, but prophets that called people to get ready for a world that would be completely changed. One of the ways these images capture the power of God to break into the world is by looking out at the physical world, the phenomena we see in nature, and then describing them turned upside down. Jesus uses this same technique to get his disciples ready for the change to come. So, for example, the sun. What is the sun supposed to do? I didn't think this would be so hard, friends. (laughs) I heard rise. Rise is an answer I'll accept. What else is the sun supposed to do? Shine. Wow, good job, Trinity. Well, the sun, which is supposed to shine, it's going to be dark. The moon will not be light. The stars, which are supposed to be where? In the sky. They're going to fall. I heard it, Julia. Good job. In the sky. They're going to fall from the heavens as the powers of the cosmos shake. That's the kind of reordering that is coming as our Lord will die and rise from the dead conquering the power of sin and death forever. Now, there are lots of writings in our scriptures that fall into this apocalyptic category, and they're dramatic, intentionally so. They envision a life-altering kind of change, and that has often made people afraid. Because as much as we say we want new life, it's actually terrifying to think that the world might change that the way of life we know and enjoy might change, and that the new life we say we want will require something of us. These apocalyptic writings have even been used to intentionally stoke fear in people, to threaten the end of the world as we know it. But here, in Mark's gospel, Jesus uses these image, images to describe darkness not to draw us into fear, but, as we've been hearing for weeks, to get us ready, 
to be on watch so that we can receive new life and also be carriers of the light in a dark world. Hear now Mark 13, verses 24 to 31. But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather the elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this morning, we're going to talk about darkness. On one hand, the dark is not bad. It's actually essential for the rhythm of the earth, the turning of our planet, the wonder of a natural cycle for resting and waking, for our bodies to sleep and work, although we might be a little off this morning after daylight saving time. Darkness is necessary for seeds to germinate in the ground and then reach for the light that will let them grow. Darkness lets us see the awesome beauty of creation, from the stars that are still up there in the heavens, to the swath of the northern lights, to the simplicity of a sunrise. But darkness is also a word we use for brokenness particularly when light does not seem to follow in the ways we hope and expect, when in our pain and grief and depression and illness, light doesn't break through the cracks and hope isn't enough to comfort us or show us what to do next. Our experiences of darkness are real and they are powerful. Sometimes we wake to a new day and don't know whether any good will come of it. Sometimes we don't see how to put one foot in front of the other, and often we can't see an obvious light in a world where the balance seems to have shifted too much to the power of death. Writing about this very passage in Mark, Christopher Hudson captures the power of dark with a question. Amid the smoke of battle, the fog of politics, the confusion of economic distress, the babble of would-be leaders wearing God masks and claiming divine authority. How shall we know which way to turn? He answers his own question this way. God's people should not be surprised or confused because Jesus warned us ahead of time that such things would happen. Darkness has always been part of our experience. Depending on how you count and what you translate, there are close to 200 references to darkness in our scriptures. And perhaps more importantly, there are about twice as many mentions of light. When Jesus talks about the coming of the Son of Man in darkness, he is not chicken little saying the sky is falling. He is God, acknowledging the pain and suffering that we know, and telling us that darkness is part of the inbreaking of light. In what will be the final of his days on earth, he is turning us toward the cross where the power of light will come through the dark. This is the promise we hear every single Christmas Eve when the unthinkable happens and God becomes human and sets out on a life that will bring every bit of human darkness. Every Christmas Eve, we read from John 1, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. Now I can put together lovely images of light and dark all day and they might not change a thing about how we act 
after this hour. But Lent is a season of turning ourselves toward the Lord who calls us to be disciples. So I'll offer two ways that we might walk differently toward the cross. First, while darkness will come into every life, we have a choice about whether we seek it. Darkness is powerful, so powerful that it can become our focus without our even realizing it. Just a few weeks ago, many of you were there at our annual talent show in the loft. Dana and Hart Deer, I see Dana and I want to thank you for this, Dana. Dana and Hart Deer sang a beautiful duet of a Simon and Garfunkel classic I hadn't thought about in years, The Sound of Silence. Do you all remember that melody? Do you remember that song? And the opening words of that song, do you remember? Hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again. Sometimes, especially when light is not apparent, we are drawn to the dark. We even start to seek it. Each year, new words that have become part of our culture are added to the dictionary. Did y'all know that's happening? It's happening even now while we're sitting here. It's pretty interesting to see which words make the cut. And in September 2023, 690 new words were added to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. I saw an article about it at the time, and I learned a few new words, like the word nicktonasty. Do you all know this one? It's fun to say. Try it. Nicktonasty. Well, it means plant movement, such as the closing of a flower's petals or the reorientation of a leaf's position that occurs in response to changes in light, such as the onset of dark. Word nerd that I am, I was immediately drawn to this image from the natural of world because, of course, of course, when a plant that needs light to grow and thrive finds itself with a change in dark, it moves, it turns, it closes or opens to find the way for the light to get in. But another of the words added to the dictionary in 2023 was the compound word doom scrolling. Do you all know this one? Nope, I'm about to tell you what it means. And now it's in the dictionary. It means to spend excessive time online, scrolling or surfing through news and other content that makes one feel sad, anxious, and angry. Darkness is seductive. It starts to feel like an old friend drawing us to dwell in those battles and political fogs and the leaders wearing God masks. Maybe we're doom scrolling with hope, looking to find light in there, but maybe we're getting ourselves lost in the dark, growing so accustomed to it that light starts to hurt our eyes. In Lent, we hear our Lord talking about darkness not to bring us to despair, but to point us to new light, telling us even to look for it. Like those leaves, like those petals with their nicktonasty, turn, open, be ready for the light that still shines in the darkness and will not be overcome. Now to be clear, there are times when that word rings hollow, we can't always change. There are experiences of dark that we don't just choose and we can't turn them off. Grief and anxiety and depression are not a choice. And I'm not saying that we should hide our heads in the sand and ignore the darkness in the world. Our invitation to be open to light is not to pretend that dark isn't real. It's to know that darkness is not the end. Darkness is a precursor to the light. And when any one of us struggles to find light to hold, we have a second invitation. As disciples, all living in a world where we know dark, we can carry light for each other. We say this every week as our very talented acolytes come up here. 
the light of Christ enters our space and then we follow it out into the world, carrying a bit of it with us. I know every person in this room and every one of you online have known dark. Some of you are walking by faith alone right now. I also know that in our darks, it isn't always John 1, or the power of incarnation, or the promise of resurrection that comes to mind and brings us light. But I hope you have been offered light by somebody, your partner, parent, child, friend, whoever is holding the other corner of your iPad as you watch this online, your neighbor, a caregiver, a kind nurse or doctor, or the person who always offers to carry your bags at the Publix, Maybe someone in this church has been light for you. That is not to deny dark, but to remember that we walk in dark together. Joel and I had the chance to hear some live music on Thursday. That's always a light in darkness for us. And we heard a singer-songwriter I had never heard of before. She's an Americana folk singer. Her name is Maya DeVitri, and I commend her music to you. Before singing one of her songs, she talked about the recent death of her grandmother, well into her 90s, and she told the story of a moment when she was sitting with her grandmother and she asked her for a pearl of wisdom. With that much life experience, she expected her grandmother to offer a grand pronouncement of some kind. She didn't. She said that she'd had a good life. She talked about French fries and orange sodas, and the necessity of everyday bits of light. Part of Maya's song goes like this. I am a daughter, a sister, a mother. For a long time, I was a wife. I've had squirrels in my ceiling and heartache and healing. Oh, I've had a beautiful life. What can I say? Just be good to your sweethearts and gardens. Be good to your dogs and your faraway friends. And when you find bits of light, hold on to them tight. You'll need all of them when your world changes again. As we walk to the cross, where eternal light will wrestle with dark before overcoming it, may we give up our fascination with the dark we choose and be light for each other in the darkness we do not. Amen.